Oz here with another challenge that I've invited Kevin Lairbase to help solve. And I'm gonna take you through the solutions that both he and I came up with. So here's the situation. Last week, Kevin and I were up in Toronto at the Model Off Global Training Camp. And in a session with Liam Bostic, I was reminded of something that a friend asked me several years ago. We've got 20 students in a class. And the instructor would like people to be paired with somebody new each week. So over 20 weeks, each person will have a project with a brand new person. How do you lay out those pairs? Now let's start thinking about this. If you've got 20 students and you want to pair them up, that's basically 20 squared and you wind up with 400 pairs, 20 times 20, 400. But what happens when you do that? You wind up with things that make no sense in that whole list of 400. First of all, if you have Joanne in the class, a pairing of Joanne and Joanne makes no sense. So those have to be peeled out of your final set. And if you have Joanne and Helena, that's fine. But then if you have Helena and Joanne, that's a repeat of the first one. That has to be pulled out. And those are the things that make this complicated. It's easy to get to 400. It's harder to get down to the 190 unique and legitimate pairs. First of all, let's look at a formula that'll help us know how many legitimate pairs we should have. Here is the formula that we need, where n equals the number in our total set. So if there are 20 students, n is 20. R represents the groupings that we wanna make. Therefore, R is going to be two because we wanna look at pairs. If we wanted to look at trios, then R would be a three. Here is Kevin's spreadsheet and a reminder of how our conversation went. So we start with the question of how to make these pairs. Kevin then suggested that this is a Cartesian join. Oh yeah, and I remembered something about this. A Cartesian join is also called a cross join. So that was a good point he made. And so I figured, all right, I am going to make a cross join in getting transform. And then Kevin concluded that he would go the formula route. For this example, we're going to use 10 names. Here are the 10 names. And one thing that I learned from Kevin is that there is a function for figuring out how many pairs that we need to have. Look at this. C-O-M-B-I-N. That tells us that with 10 names and we want to do pairs, we should have 45 in the end. Now let's play with that a little bit. All right, so the formula equals C-O-M. All right, C-O-M-B-I-N, double click. The number 10, comma, 2, number chosen, enter. So we should have 45. If we have 20 students and we want pairs, we're going to have a total of 190 legitimate pairs. What if we do want trios? 3. Out of 20 students we would have 1,140 unique trios. Now what if we wanted groups of one? There would be 20 groups of one, and we should expect that. How many groups of 20? One group of 20. All right, so solutions. 
The first solution that Kevin explores is the brute force solution, also known as stack the stuff up and figure it out. So basically that's what's happening here. Just match everything all up and then figure out the ones that work and the ones that don't. Now here is a solution that Kevin doesn't like, but I like it. It's my favorite of the ones that he created. We start with a table of the names and the names repeated. And then he makes a pivot table. He formats it a certain way with a tabular layout, repeat all items in the labels, show items with no data. Right, so now we have every name matched up with every name. And then Kevin goes through a series of helper columns that put the names in order and make it easier to write formulas to have Excel pull out the irrelevant pairs. So here in these first two columns, he's getting them in order. Look at this. It's easy to see Anna's set. Okay, Anna's set is first on all of these. But notice when we get down here, Anna's set comes first and then Dorothy is next. Let's go down to some more. Look at Joanne. Anna's set comes first. Dorothy comes first. Helena comes first. And then Joanne is next. And that'll make it easier to identify when a pair has been repeated. This column is where Kevin puts the names together and then asks, do the two names match each other, as in Anaset, Anaset? Or, in the case of Anaset, Dorothy, that column is going to tell us when Dorothy, Anaset has shown back up. So here is true, true that Anaset has shown up here for the first time and it's a match. And his filter says hide because we have the same name here. That's a true. And he set this filter up to hide it. Let's go down and look at something else. Anaset Iris. Okay. This column tells us that Anaset and Iris that's not a pair. It doesn't say Iris, Iris, or Anaset, Anaset. But this false says that we have seen this pair before. So let's see if we can find an Iris, Anaset. And there it is. Anaset, Iris. That's the first time it showed up. And when we get back down here, no. No. This is not the first time it's shown up. Therefore, his filter says to hide it. Now, for more details on Kevin's solutions, you can check out his video and I'll put links there. Let's move over to my solution. Here is something that I thought about while I was preparing to record this. OK, this is what I'm calling the matrix solution. I have the names. The 10 names here and the 10 names going across the top. And I wrote a formula, and here's what the formula says. If F5 equals G4, in this case, if male equals male, then remain empty. Otherwise, join the text. Let's go down this column. Look at that, we've got Iris male got Dorothy Mel. I'm going to drag this across and then down. We could choose either the names inside the blue triangle or the ones outside of the blue triangle and we would have unique pairs. Now let's dive into the get and transform solution. Here we go. We've got the 10 names in a table. Go to data and start a query from table. But I've done this already. So let's go to show queries. And here is what I did. Here's our query editor and I'm going to open this. Okay. 
So what I did was I brought in that table twice. Here is what I call students two, this query with just the names, and I added an index column that starts with zero. And then I brought the table in again and added an index that starts with zero. We see that. So now what we've got is Helena is always zero and the set is always four. Kedra is always six. Mel is always nine. You get that. Now here is where I do the cross join. Now a cross join is where you match two data sets, match everything in set one with everything in set two. And let's say that you have six objects and 15 colors and each of the objects needs to be each of those 15 colors. You can do a cross join to get a list of everything that you need to end up with. So here's the cross join. I add a custom column. I just left it named custom and I just put in students two because that's the name of the other query. And I click OK. And notice Helena zero has a table next to her name. Next, expand the column. That means click these arrows that are pointing away from each other. Now we see Helena is matched with Helena, Joanne, all of the students. Everybody is matched with everybody and we wind up with a hundred. See, 10 times 10, a hundred. Now we have to pluck out the irrelevant pairs. I'm going to add a conditional column. I call this column S1 for student one. And this says if index, if index equals index one, then null. Otherwise, students. So this is saying if zero equals zero, then null. But where zero does not equal one, bring back students. Thus, it brought back Helena right there. That's what that column is doing. It's a test to find out where a student is matched with him or herself. And then I did a filter to get rid of the null values. Next, another conditional column. For student two, if index one is greater than index, then student one, otherwise null. One is greater than zero, therefore it brought me back student one, Joanne. So Joanne is there. Let's look at one where we put in a null. Index one. That says zero. If it's greater than index, then bring back student one. If not, null. And therefore, we've got null. So basically, what this column is doing is it's helping me determine if I already have a pair, even though it might be out of order. So here is this null right here in S2. Okay, that means Joanne Helena. But we already have a Helena Joanne. Therefore, this is null. The next step is to filter out nulls in S2. There are our pairs, and then we can remove the other columns. 
and close and load this to the workbook. And here is where I have it on hide. These are our final pairs. Now, here's the sexy part with getting transformed. We've got more names. 12 more names. Move these up into the table. Oh, baby. Look at this. 22 students, 231 unique pairs. All right. You ready for it? All right. I'm about to refresh this thing. All right. Go. Do it. Oh, look at that. 231 rows loaded. Check this out. I be God damn it. Look at that. Look at that. Getting transformed, y'all. You gotta get this thing. You gotta get it. Because we got everybody. Check that out. And what if we did say that Marco, Marco is gone. Remove that roll. Boom. We got 210. All right. We gotta refresh this again. Oh, here we go. Refresh. Boom. 210. No more Marco. I tell you, this is a brain twister. All right, there you go. Now, please, if you do have questions, please ask. Kevin and I would be glad to answer. We love sharing this knowledge. And thanks to Kevin for engaging in this solution with me. It's a lot of fun to do this kind of stuff with you, man. So, all right, that is it for now. And look forward to my next video. All right. Oh, Lord. Lord, Lord, look at that, look at that. Ha! Yeah. See, we did it.